The Ministry of Secondary Education has developed a distance learning platform for students of secondary education in Cameroon. A series of lessons taught by qualified teachers for secondary school students. Under the stewardship of Professor Pauline Nalovalyonga, in collaboration with the Ministry of Posts and Telecommunications, CAMTEL, CRTV and UNESCO. We are introducing distance learning as another teaching and learning method which is different from the traditional classroom setting that you are all used to. In the distance education mode, you are not with the teacher in person, so take your time, relax, listen to the teacher, take down notes and visit the following links for any questions or answers to your questions. Take it in your stride. This is Cameroon's solution to COVID-19 and beyond. Professor Nalova Lyunga, Minister of Secondary Education. Welcome to this learning session. I am Gobela Arnold Mafo, your literature and English teacher. This session is, of course, for Form 4, and we'll be studying literature in English. Now, before we proceed to the content for this current session, you would recall that in our last session, in which we started exploring uh, the second chapter of Linus Asong's The Crown of Thorns, we gave ourselves some work to do. So let's then explore what it is that we're asked to do and uh, what we found. To begin with, we're told to read chapter two of The Crown of Thorns and identify two major things. First, the major characters, major characters in chapter two, and secondly, to pick out the main issue. What is the major concern? What is the major concern? You might think about it as the major theme, as the main thing that happens. You can think of it in any of these terms. But we just wanted that you should be able to show some proof that you've understood the major thing that happens in that second chapter. So those were the two tasks. And um, if you did attempt, you would have realized that, first, there are quite a number of characters that intervene in chapter two, like we mentioned in the last class. So who are some of these? Let's start with Ngobo 4. We'll just remind ourselves that Ngobo 4 is the, an elder, is a leader of the tribe. We also have Bekoncho, who is a teacher from the coast. So of course you might want to take note because it's not just a case of knowing the names of these characters, you must recall who they are in the text and eventually what it is that they do. So we well, go both for and be contra and you would, you would have realized if you attempted to do this work that they are the ones that drive the action. It is your ideas that spur all the different things that happen in this chapter. But they are not the only major characters. There are others. I think of Chief Chindia, who of course is central to what happens in the entire text. So we have Chief Chindia, the major character, we also have some major characters that we didn't see in the first chapter. We're talking especially about Gangabe and also about Denwontio, who is also an elder. One of those in the group of people who lead the tribe, who provide advice to the chief. Therefore, if you attempted to do this, you will have realized that these are the characters whose thoughts, whose actions, whose ideas drive what it is that happens in the second chapter of part one of uh, Linus Asong's The Crown of Thorns. The second task was then to identify the main concern in chapter two, the main concern. And we had said we can think about the main concern here in, in terms of themes. You can think about it in terms of what happens You can think about it in terms of what happens, or in terms of the plot. So again, we said the idea was just to be sure that 
after reading uh, chapter 2, you are able to say what it is that happens in it. Because remember, at the ordinary level, you frequently be asked questions on uh, a detailed account to say what you recall to have happened in the text. So if you are able to do this, when you read every chapter, you would already be preparing yourself to tackle such questions when they come up. So what is the main concern in chapter 2? The main concern is the announcement that the God of gods of the people of Kokomo Sumamonje has been stolen. Not only has that God been stolen, but the God has been sold to the white man. So what is the fallout? What are the consequences? What are the consequences? What's the impact? So it is announced that uh, a kirk has been stolen and sold to a white man and then there is the fallout because the people of course consider a kirk their god of gods. So obviously when this announcement is made, as you would expect, there is a fallout. There are consequences. People react. The characters react to that news. So that is the main thing that happens in chapter 2. So you might want to be asking yourself then, how is the announcement done? Who does the announcement? Why does he announce? How does he go about it? Does the announcement itself contain the message or does he call the people together? How does he go about it? And whose idea is it in terms of how he announces this information? So those are the key concerns in chapter 2 of part 1, of course, of Linus Asong's The Crown of Thorns. Let's move on to uh, the lesson proper for this session. And we are going to be analyzing plot and character in chapter 2. You will recall that in the previous session again, we gave an overview of what happens in this chapter. And that is why we said you should be able to at least say the main concern after you reread the chapter. You should be able to bring out the main things that happen and you should be able to identify the key characters and what they do. Now, moving on to this new list. How are we going to go about it? We'll begin by laying out our objectives. We'll then recall what it is that we have done previously. And then we'll dive proper into the analysis. We'll get into the analysis proper. Remember, we're analyzing plot and character. You might also want to record that when we talk of character at the ordinary level, we include in that role play. So what do the characters do? What do they think? What do they decide not to do? And what do all of these elements say about them? So we're analyzing plot, we're analyzing character, and within that we'll also be looking at the role played by each of these characters. We'll then summarize what it is that we would have done would we'll have an exercise to evaluate ourselves and then of course we we'll give ourselves uh, some work to do after this session so to get us started then what are our objectives what do we want to do in this lesson first we want to provide again an overview of what happens in chapter two remember we have read this chapter and we want to be able to think what happens in the chapter can we say it out but the method we we'll use to do that is a little bit different because in doing so, we are going to lean on commentary of the plot. We'll provide some commentary on plot. We'll provide commentary also on characterization as well as role play. Therefore, the method that we'll use to revise and to provide an overview of the second chapter is by looking at role play. Who does what? And when they do what it is that they do, how does it lead to plot development? Therefore, that's how we're going to go about it. So we're reviewing the plot, but we'll do that by looking at each character and thinking about what it is that they do, the role that they, that they play. So through that means then, we'll be able to not only provide an overview of what happens in this chapter, would also be able to comment on the characters themselves and say clearly how each of them contributes to the development of chapter 2. But in order for us to do that, we must recall, of course, 
that we know about the elements of fictional prose, plot, certain characterization, style, themes. We've talked about this in previous sessions. We are also very familiar with the significance of the title of the, of the novel, The Crown of Thorns. We've already explained the significance of that. We know about the theft of a cocoa and the sale of a cocoa to the white man. And we are also very familiar with that disagreement, with that disappointment that animates chapter one, where Gobofor confronts Achibofor with the accusation that he sands uh, a sort of sword in the theft and sale of a cocoa. Building on that knowledge, therefore, let's start by reflecting how do chiefs typically collaborate with the elders we're thinking about chiefs we're thinking about elders. we know that there is usually close collaboration in traditional african societies between the chief or the fawn and the elders the council of elders who advise him who guide him to whom he con in whom he confides that's the chief confides in them and seeks their guidance, especially when there are difficult uh, situations to be handled. When the tribe is going through difficult times, the fawn tends to lean on the wisdom and the reliability and the goodwill of his council of elders. But for that to happen, how what what, what values are supposed to be upheld? What principles are the chiefs? as well as the of different tribes, as well as the elders, supposed to uphold in order for that synergy to exist. So you realize that typically in communities, traditional African communities that function well, that have a good relationship between the council of elders and the chief, the first thing is that there's collaboration. Everybody puts their hands on deck to ensure that matters of the tribe move forward smoothly. There's collaboration between the chief and uh, the elders. There's also trust and respect. So in addition to collaboration, there's mutual trust and respect. Why? Because the fawn knows that the elders typically want the best for the tribe. They are not self-serving, or at least they shouldn't be self-serving. The elders, on their part, know that they're supposed to guide the fawn. They typically understand matters of tradition, matters of culture better than the fawn, especially when it's just a new fawn, a newly crowned fawn. Therefore, there's that mutual respect, there's that collaboration, there's that trust that typically animates the functioning of the council of elders as well as the chief. But the next question we should ask ourselves is, is this typically the case? Is it the case all the time? And that leads us to the second question. What might cause this in, chief, in a chief elder relationship? And what is the this we're talking about? First, conflict. What could be a source of conflict between the elders and a chief within the traditional uh, African setup? Of course, we're asking this conscious that conflict between the chief and his elders spells disaster for the tribe. What, and what a suspicion. Under what circumstances can that trust, that should, and that typically exists between the chief and his elders be ruptured? What can rupture that trust, that reliance, that confidence? So what might cause this? we realize that there are a whole range of situations that could lead to suspicion and conflict between the elders and uh, the fawn. First, it could be that there's a breach of traditional norms, especially on the part of the fawn. If he doesn't subscribe to some of the norms that the elders are supposed to guard, are supposed to perpetrate, that could lead to some tension, it could lead to conflict. There could also be just deviation from the norms and traditions of the people. If the fawn, for example, is expected to have five wives at least, but the fawn decides that he wants to be, mono, to, to be monogamous, that is obviously a deviation from the traditions and customs of the people and is likely to cause some friction. 
There's also uh, endangerment of the tribe. If either the elders or the fawn well, seem to be involving themselves in activities that could put the tribe as a whole in danger, that of course would cause some suspicion and some friction. It could also be taboo behaviors and so many other possibilities. The point is, when these things begin to happen, it is clear that the leadership of that tribe, of that village, is already going in the wrong direction. And is this the case in the crown of thorns? Is this the case in Kokonoko Sumamonje? Obviously, it is. Because in chapter 2, we would realize that Bekoncho, first of all, uh, is the one that brings the news about the theft of Akoko from the coast. Therefore, he's the, he's the one that brings the news of that theft. Now, because he comes with this news and decides to confide in Achebofo only, he gains Achebofo's trust. We recall here that uh, Bekoncho is much younger, much younger than uh, Gobefo is, than all the elders are. But because he has come with very valuable information and very sensitive information for that matter, and going to Ngobofo to let him know that that's what's happening, he gains Gobofo's trust. Now, is that all that he does? He goes ahead to cast doubt on the idea that the theft could have been done by one person. Solo job. So he, he lets Gobofo know that he is not very sure that the theft and transportation and sale of a could have been done by one person. Why? Because there are lots of checkpoints along the road. Police checkpoints. And it is precisely because of this that he suggests that the DO could have been involved. Because whoever transported Akoko would have needed to go past all those police checkpoints. Would have needed an amount of authority to be able to take uh, Akoko from Sumamonje right to the coast and to effectively sell uh, Akoko to the white man. Therefore, after he indicates his suspicion that the DO could be involved in this, he then proposes that an emergency meeting of the elders should be called. An emergency meeting. And he, he, he proposes in addition that this meeting, the, the agenda for this meeting should not be made known until all the elders are gathered. And what is the purpose for this? He wants to observe. He wants to observe and to see those that would react in a suspicious manner when the news is broken to them. Therefore, he realized that despite his youth, Bekoncho seems to have some foresight. He seems to be pretty clever. Now, what does Gobofo do in chapter 2? He stuns the entire village. He takes everybody by surprise. When at 4 p.m., that's in the afternoon, what does he do? He strikes into the talking drum. Now, you might recall that the talking drum is played only at night. It is played by a mass spirit. And it is played on the authorization of the phone. So everybody is taken by surprise when they hear the announcement coming on the talking drum in the afternoon, 4 p.m. That's afternoon. Therefore, he deliberately goes against the norm. However, in doing so, he does not reveal the purpose of the emergency meeting. He doesn't do that yet. He waits until all the elders are present. And only then does he trace the history of the people of Kokonok Sumamonje. And as he traces that history, he emphasizes the role of tradition. He says they've only been able to exist for that long, to survive, to thrive for that long, because they have upheld their tradition. And at the center of that tradition, according to Ngobo 4, is Akirk, their god of gods. He says all their successes as a tribe, everything they've been able to accomplish as a tribe, has been under the guidance and the protection of their god of gods, Akirk. Therefore, we realize that it's at this point when he has elevated Akirko, when he has reminded all the elders and the others present about the importance, about the centrality of Akirko to the people, that he breaks the horrible news. And what is that horrible news? That Akirko has been stolen and sold to the white man. And as we would expect, the entire uh, council of elders is stunned by that information. However, 
with the passionate delivery of the history of the people of Gokokono Sumamonje, Ngobo for accidentally steps on and crushes his pipe. And remember, this is significant. Now, in Biongon culture, and remember that uh, Small Monje is actually part of Biongong. In Biongong culture, when a person steps on their pipe, that is an indication that they may be going crazy, that they may be losing their sanity. So that is why as soon as he does that, as soon as he steps on it, he immediately goes ahead to explain himself, to reassure the others that he is actually fine, that he is sane. At this moment, when Chinja tries to get into the hall one hour later, or not even at this moment, but even before he begins to trace this history, Chinja comes one hour later than everybody else. And as soon as he started delivering all of this, and then he's announced the theft and sale of Akoko, Chinja tries to leave the hall, but he's blocked. He is blocked by Gobofo, who takes that bold step. Chinja himself, before coming to the meeting, doesn't know what it's about. And he comes an hour after everybody is already assembled. He's so casually dressed in jeans. He has his pocket of Tuskers in his pocket and all of that. He sits and then begins to smoke. Shows an amount of callousness and lack of deference for the elders who are there. And then in addition, he tries to ask the question as to why he was not informed about the purpose of the meeting. And of course, this is something that is pretty unconstitutional as far as small money is concerned because the fund should know. However, it was not a mistake. It was a deliberate act to not tell the phone because, of course, the conscious suspects that he might have a hand or might have had a hand in the theft and soul of a cooker. Now, on his part, the Wancho is initially angry. Remember, the Wancho is one of the others as well. He's initially very antagonistic towards Gobofo because he feels that if something so grave has happened, uh, Gobofo shouldn't have carried it on his head, so to speak. Because it's a matter of the entire tribe. And part of this is because he has not yet had the full details. He hasn't seen evidence that Akaka has actually been stolen. So he feels that Gobo for is a little bit disrespectful even to the phone. However, just as he is taking uh, his emotions out on Gobo 4, Gangabe comes in to announce a triple force suicide. That a triple force has found himself. He's killed himself. So immediately after that, the watcher immediately suspects that something could actually be going wrong. And he acknowledges his mistake. Although he, he does that and actually shows some remorse, only after he has heard the country's story. And then he leads all the others to the shrine of Akurka. And there they are shocked to see that where Akurka used to be is a fake god. Therefore, he immediately pulls it down. And then leads the people as they destroy this fake god. And then he suggests that to be sure that the people who were involved in the theft and sale of Akaka are not in their midst, everyone should lick the ashes of the burnt fake god and swear by Kunga. He does so believing that nobody would dare to swear if they were in fact involved in the theft and sale of the god of gods. However, everybody licks, but no one is struck. Everybody remains fine. It is at this moment that Gobofo begins to think that since Gangabe had come and said that Achebofo, before hanging himself, had said that Gomen had killed him. Remember Gomen here? Yeah? Refers to the D.O. Martin Ezetebon. So he, he reads some meaning into that and then they decide that the next step to take is to go to the D.O.'s house. Now, based on this, we can see very clearly that Achebo 4 is down to earth. How, how is that evident? He listens to the suggestions of uh, someone who is significantly younger than he is in the person of Bekoncho. Although he is the elder, although he is significantly advanced his age, he is able to listen to the advice, to the suggestions of Bekoncho and to actually implement them. So in this case, he shows that he's pretty down to earth. And he's also resolute, especially in the way he blocks the phone from leaving because he wants to get some information. He wants the control to observe and see how the phone reacts. He's equally brave because, of course, it, it is not easy to confront your own phone in that manner. What about Bekoncho? Now, Bekoncho shows in this chapter that he's very, very clever. 
he is smart and that he's even foresighted because he is able to anticipate that because human beings are as they are when they are confronted with information about something they are guilty of doing their reaction would betray their guilt therefore he shows his foresight by suggesting these different courses of action to go before chief tinja on his part is pretty much aloof he doesn't care even when the, the information is, is is given he doesn't show any shock he's even in addition he's disrespectful of the elders remember he comes an hour late he comes and smokes in their midst and even tries to leave the meeting before everything is done therefore you see that he seems to think that he's a little bit better than everybody else he behaves haughtily the water on his part is initially rash we see that in the way he reacts to the information and Gobofo provides without waiting to hear everything. However, he also shows that he is remorseful. He's a wrong character. He doesn't stay stuck in his rashness. But once he has evidence that what Gobofo is saying actually has some merit and is as great as Gobofo says, uh, as Gobofo says it is, he then apologizes and then he's very decisive because he immediately says, let's go and see the shrine. Let's pull this down. Let's burn. Let's all swear. So he's very decisive. Safe. What have we seen so far? We've seen that in chapter 2, an emergency meeting of elders is called by Ngobo 4. After that meeting is called, or during that meeting, he reveals that their cocoa has been stolen and sold to a white man. Now, with anger and all of that, they watch you lead the people to destroy that God and then to swear everybody their innocence. Now, in terms of character traits, we've seen clearly that uh, Bekon, the, the events in this chapter are driven by Bekonjo's cleverness, Gobofo's bravery, Chinja's carefreeness, aloofness, as well as Bekonjo's decisiveness. Let's evaluate ourselves, therefore. Now, question one. Which of the following is not a character trait on Gobofo, as you read in chapter two? Is it that he is resolute? egoistic, courageous, or open to advice. Remember, we're talking about which of them is not. And you see clearly that of all the different things, we'll be able to say that he is not egoistic. He is not egoistic. Therefore, that is the exception. Who brings news of Achebofo's death to the elders? Is it Denwoncho, Martin Ezeitebon, Gangabe, or Bekoncho? Who brings news of uh, Achebofo's death? Now, you recall that during the meeting, especially just at that moment when the Ocho is vibrating, he's being very antagonistic towards Ngobo for, for what he considers to be Ngobo for disrespect. It's at that moment that Gangabe comes in with the news that Achibofo has hanged him. So, therefore, our correct answer here would be Gangabe. Three, Ngobo feels the need to confirm his sanity because... He feels the need to confirm that he is saying that he is not going crazy. So why, why does he feel that he needs to do that? Everybody should be able to see that he's okay. But why does he feel that he needs to assure the elders that he is actually fine? Is it because A, his revelations are similar to a madman's? Or B, he wants everyone to know the true criminals? C, no one is likely to believe his story? Or is it because D, he steps on his pipe? And you recall that uh, it is at the moment when, with all of the emotions, having traced the history of the people of Kokonoko Sumamonje, as he tries to go back to his city, what does he do? He steps on his pipe. Or said in Byongon culture, stepping on your pipe is considered an indication that you are losing your sanity, that you are going mad, you are going crazy. That is why he feels the need to explain himself, to let the others know all these things he's saying, serious as they are significant as they are, are not an indication that he's going crazy, although he has stepped on his pipe. Four, Chief Tinja's behavior in chapter two may be most suitably described as, think good here, most suitably, most suitably described as, as A, unnatural and suspicious, B, disrespectful but innocent, differential and altruistic, C or D, malicious and self-serving. So let's start from the bottom. Is he really malicious? No, he's not malicious. But is he self-serving? Definitely, yes. He's thinking all about himself. He wants to do stuff for himself. He's not differential because he's disrespectful. Neither is he altruistic. He's disrespectful, yes. But is he innocent? No, there's no evidence for that. And we know that, in fact, the chief is not innocent. 
Is his uh, behavior unnatural? Yes. When he hears the news, obviously, why people are getting shocked, he doesn't really show any kind of reaction. As the phone, as someone who's supposed to be the custodian of the tribe, we would expect that he should react in some way. But we also know why he doesn't react, obviously, because he has a hand in the theft and the sale. Does he behave in a manner that is suspicious? Obviously, because if his reaction to that is unnatural, that already makes him a suspect. Therefore, our correct answer will be A. So he behaves in an unnatural manner and also in a suspicious manner. And lastly, he suggests the leaking of ashes and swearing of innocence. Now, this is just a content question. So who suggests that ashes should be leaked and that everyone present should swear to Pungam such that if they were involved in the theft and sale of Akaka, they will be stricken down. Is in Gangabe, the country, the Ocho or Chinzia? Obviously, we know that it is. Then won't you who suggests that? But unfortunately, everybody leaks and nobody gets stricken down. Now, what we do as our assignment? Read chapter 3 of the crown of thorns therefore you realize that in the next lesson we're moving on to chapter three so your task is to read chapter three and uh, first identify the key interveners interveners during the meeting at the dio's house because in that third chapter as you realize the key thing is the meeting at the dio's house at the end of chapter two it has been decided that everyone should go to the dio's house and lay this problem at his feet so when you read through that chapter identify the key interveners i remember what each of them says and then, in addition, state three aspects of the deal's character as revealed during the meeting. Now, in our next lesson, we'll move on, like I just said, to a textual study of the Crown of Thorns, chapter 3. <laughs>